<clears throat> Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Daniel, and I'm creative strategist at Somewhere Else. Uh, just a quick introduction about uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, Somewhere Else is, uh, is an innovation agency. Uh, we specialize in uh, working with businesses and trying to bring a strategic angle to how virtual reality can actually help them reach their, their strategic goals, their, their core mission. And for the next 45 minutes, uh, more or less, I'm going to be sharing some insights that we've learned in our practice about uh, storytelling and how not to tell stories in VR. And then uh, we're going to leave some room open in the end for, uh, for a short Q&A. Um, so before I start, just a quick question. Who in this room is a VR creator, just by show of hands? And uh, who wants to create VR but somehow hasn't started yet? Awesome, awesome. So I guess that, well, I'll just skip a few slides. So in the past few years, um, I believe that the industry has collectively been writing the book on VR storytelling, trying to learn how to approach this, this new medium. And I'm going to be sharing some, some of those insights. Um, VR experiences, as you all know, can be deeply affecting, can, be, can really touch people. Uh, but it also, in my opinion, requires a new breed of storytellers, a new type of creators. Um, and this is a type of creators that, in my vision, has to borrow a lot from other crafts and other creative disciplines. And today, I'm going to give you a small introduction to the language of VR storytelling as we see it. Um, and actually, what better place to, to to have a look at that, then surrounded by these beautiful paintings, these, these visions of these ancient masters who were also storytellers in their own right. Uh, so let's just rewind to where it all started for me. I, uh, I, I am an architect, or better yet, I used to be one. So back in the day, I would design spaces. I'd think of designing with walls, with windows, uh, putting the elevator in the right place, doing all of those technical drawings. but. I would also think about the physical disposition of objects in space and how this would square up with the function of the space and, and the design. But I always thought, in, in my personal view, that that wasn't enough for me. Uh, I, I always felt that there was something missing in there. Um, what I believe that some architects have rightly understood, and that's something that we can read here, and I'm going to read you a quick quote by, by Rem Kulas, a, a Dutch architect. He says that in a script, you have to link various episodes together. You have to generate suspense, and you have to assemble things through editing, for example. And in architecture, uh, you also put together spatial episodes to make sequences. Now, this, was, this is an insight that uh, I, I'm a big, big fan of Ramkulas, and an insight that really triggered something in me, which is we are, in a way, using architecture as a scripting technology. And in my opinion, um, these, these scripts that we put through architecture in space and in people are a bridge to virtual reality and how we actually script these experiences. Um, Rem Kulas is, is, in my opinion, one of the world's most interesting and innovative architectures, who, by the way, used to be a script writer for documentaries as well, so he does have that background as well. And uh, he also wrote scripts for soft porn movies, so go figure. So in my opinion, that is why I believe that the lesson that we can draw from architecture and spatial design um, is that we're using spaces to design experiences. The space is the story. And that's a little bit the theme that we're going to go through in this presentation, the idea that um, the space is the story. And we, as humans, actually embody and act out this story. We do not only passively look at it. We are in the story, and we exist in a way very closely, intimately connected to the story itself. So let me take you through a few projects that we have done, um, that we've delivered recently. And let me tell you about one key thing that we've learned with each of those projects. So starting on the first one, this one was for UEFA. And this was an experience that was shown in the final at Cardiff two years ago. And so the way that it went was that uh, we were approached by UEFA to, to take a lot of 360 content that they already had. And uh, they essentially wanted us to you know, 
make use of it because it's there, uh, it's, it's stuck in a drawer, nobody's using it. But then we took that and we started to think about ways that we could take that forward. And one of the ways that we decided to do that was through uh, creating some participation. So essentially we put the user in the shoes of a player who just won the Champions League and he goes through the corridor and he's able to pick up the, the cup and we put, you, why watch the game when you can actually take part in this aspirational experience of actually lifting the cup and winning the game? So that was lesson number one. Uh, the lesson that VR is, is a participatory medium, that there's interaction that we can actually derive from it and, and leverage for our purposes. The second experience that I'm gonna show you was, uh, was for Adidas. And so in this experience, it went more or less in the same fashion. Um, so essentially, we let visitors of Adidas shops in China climb a mountain in Corsica. So again, the way that this went was Adidas came to us with 360 videos of some Adidas-sponsored athletes that were climbing Mount Delicatessen in Corsica. Um, and once again, we decided to create an aspirational tale where the user steps in the role of a climber. So the first part of the experience, you actually follow these climbers, you look at them, you understand how they are using equi uh, Adidas equipment and gear to climb. And secondly, uh, you complete the climb at a second half of the experience. So you actually have to put your hands up and grab those rocks and pull yourself up. Um, so here we went from the awe of the Corsican landscape, which is very beautiful, to the tension of the 360 videos to finally creating a, sen a sense of embodied achievement. So the lesson there was that we wanted to put an emotional arc there, obviously drawing from the from more traditional storytelling modalities, um, creating that three-step arc of emotion. Um, the third experience that I want to sort of show you that we did was for Canal Plus, and it was for a French spy show. Um, they essentially wanted to promote the new season of this show, and their idea was, let's, let's put a 360 camera in a press conference. Um, but then we thought to ourselves, who, who, who goes to a press conference? It's not gonna be better because it's in 360. So what we decided to do is, why don't we put you in the shoes of the protagonist of this spy show, and essentially what happens is that this was a trailer that was filmed on set with the real actors, uh, but you weren't just a spectator looking at it through a frame, you were actually in the shoes of this protagonist going around the streets of Paris, solving the crime with your hero. So the lesson number three is that VR builds presence through interactions with other characters. Social presence is, is one of the ways that we actually know that we are here because of, we are sort of framed by everyone else uh, in terms of those interactions. Uh, and then finally, the, the last experience that I want to show you was for France Télévisions. Um, and, and this was another experience for, for a French TV show uh, that is called Witnesses. And it's a very sad story. I mean, it's a, it's a uh, essentially the show is about a woman who got kidnapped and drugged and locked in a basement where she had a baby, sort of a horror story. And one day she wakes up and the baby's gone. So what we decided to do is to mix the virtual and the real space. So what happens, to promote this movie, you actually go into a space, um, which is a replica of the space in the movie, and there's a headset hanging from a wire, and what you have to do is figure out a way to escape this room. It's an escape room experience in mixed reality. So to find the key that will open the door to leave the space, you have to put on the headset, where you travel back in time for like 10 hours, when you are drugged and kidnapped, and you essentially have to figure out what happened via some illusions that replicate the real space. So essentially you're actually in the same room in two different times. Um, in the one time is now, the other time is in the memory space. So the lesson that we drew from here is that VR is even more fun when you connect it with other technologies, with other mediums, in this case, scenography, escape room experiences, gamification. Um, and it's a very young medium, so there's a lot of space to innovate. And I just realized that I've been speaking without showing you the, the image, so just to have a look at, the, uh, at this, this is essentially what happened. We had the real space as well as the, um, the virtual space in simultaneous, and you essentially have to figure out how to get out of there. 
Please. Yes. Please. Hold the mic. Closer. A bit closer. Understood. OK. Sorry about that. Got it. Um, so yeah, the lesson that we learned here is VR beyond VR. So the idea that if you mix mediums, if you are creative to, to actually mingle these different storytelling modalities, it can produce interesting results. So these are a few of the lessons that we learned from our past projects. And at a certain moment, they start to stack up on top of each other, and they start to provide another level of insights. And the question here uh, that I'm going to ask is, why does VR need a new breed of storyteller? And what makes it so unique? Well, for starters, and I, I think this is something that you all know, this is a new way to tell stories. We're surrounded by frames, but in VR, there's no frame. Uh, even TVs have frames. Uh, but as uh, there was someone who said that the, the rectangle is dead, and in a way, that's true, because in VR, there's no frame. You actually live in the story. And as a creator, you're addressing an audience that's inside of the story. And that's a change of paradigm, because you're no longer just a spectator, and you become a visitor. Instead of, become, of seeing a story, you inhabit a world. Does anybody remember this scene? This is a very famous scene, right, from Psycho uh, by Hitchcock. And in your memory, is this a gory scene? Is there a lot of blood? Is it like a, 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 a sort of disgusting, gory scene? In your memory, is it? Yes. It is the director's magic that makes it seem gory. If you look, if you remember this scene, you have the violent sound for the stabbing, you have the, the video edit stacking very quick, in very quick succession, you have the blood in the whirlpool, but at, at no moment do you actually see the knife going into the body of the person. And this is the author expressing a specific vision of the experience. And we are connecting the dots in our own heads and that's why this horror is not explicit, but implicit. Um, another example. If we were filming this very scene in 360, uh, you couldn't do this. Because you, yourself, as the visitor, well, I'm going to look everywhere. I'm going to peek behind the curtain. I'm going to see what's happening with the knife entering the body. So what was possible before in the film, it is no longer possible in VR right now. <clears throat> And as a creator, especially if you come from a film uh, background, which is sort of the, um, the background that I assume most of you have, you're actually giving away one of the very core parts of your creative practice to the audience. You no longer frame, the audience frames. You merely build the environment, but the audience is the director. So in the words of Chris Milk, who's a, who's a VR director, he says that VR is the first medium that actually makes the jump from our own interpretation of an author's expression of an experience to us experiencing that firsthand. Therefore, and this is a very key sentence in my personal opinion, in VR, your consciousness is the medium. You are not designing a film. You're designing an experience actually mediated by people's consciousness. <clears throat> so let me, let me show you a video now. Let me show you a very quick video. So this very, this very funny video. Uh, so what happens in here is that in this experience, you, you have one purpose, to save the kitten. And how do you do that? By taking two steps to the, to, to, in, in the plank, by walking two meters, giving two steps. Um, but in reality, it's two centimeters high. But in virtual reality, it's 300 meters. So what you saw was that all of these people were experiencing a simulated sense of vertigo. Um, so much so that only 60% of the people who did this experience saved the cat. The rest of the people were too scared to walk that plank. Um, <clears throat> and if this was a video game, obviously in a screen, you could expect that 100% of the people would save the cat. What's the difference here? 
The difference is that VR is a holistic user experience. It is not based on someone using a device to interact with reality. Rather, it's designing the reality itself. You're actually responsible for 100% of your audience's audiovisual input. It is the most, the highest bandwidth communication medium there is so far. So this, what we've saw, what we've seen here was presence, was that feeling, which is sort of a neurologically verifiable um, term of presence, of actually being in this world, forgetting that you actually have a body, embodied, and becoming embodied in the virtual world. And you are designing a, a reality, and that's the ultimate design experience. So presence is that. VR is a new medium that creates presence, which is the illusion of reality. And that's the magic of the medium. That's the promise. It implies a lot in terms of content, of storytelling, of, and of creativity. Um, it involves psychology. It makes us think of ethics, of responsibility. What are we going to do with this if we actually can design reality? Uh, what happens to reality? Uh, what is reality? So one of the things that I really believe <clears throat> is that we are sort of being propelled slowly but also in another way very fast into a new cultural watershed moment, a historic moment. And people like us are in a way in the center of that because virtual reality is teaching us that reality is virtual. And I want to dig a little bit into this sentence, which is we can create and manage and orient the illusion of virtual reality in, the way, in any way that we want. That's our responsibility. <clears throat> and that's also pointing to us that everything else that we experience in so-called real reality is also uh, manageable and, and could be designed in the same way that you design a virtual reality. So that's, that's the bridge that I also always want to sort of focus on. If you design for VR, you design with the tools that you design for real reality. <clears throat> Let me show you a couple of points surrounding the idea of user experience. So the real question here is, how is VR processed by human brains? Is there anything different in the way that, by being in that headset, that it impacts our brains? How does this medium impact our behavior? So do you, do you guys know those apps where you put a picture of yourself and, and you see how you're going to look in 30 years? So this is a similar experience done by the, the Stanford University. And they were researching how VR can impact behavior. And the way that it works is as follows. They took uh, 100 students, and they divided them into two groups. Um, the first group went into virtual reality with an avatar that was around their age, so 20 to 25-year-olds. And the second group went into virtual reality um, in an avatar that was 70 years old. So once inside of VR, both groups have to do a bunch of activities. They, they have to dance, they have to play the bongo, they have a mirror to really feel embodied. Uh, and essentially, this is, this is not the purpose of the experience, right? The experience is all, I wouldn't say fake, it's, it doesn't matter. Because what matters is that after the experience, uh, there's a questionnaire. And in that questionnaire, um, they asked the students, at the very end of the questionnaire, the key question, which was, OK, we paid you $1,000 to make this study. What are you going to spend it on? And the cool thing about this is that students begin to act very differently whether they're 20 or 70 years old, uh, whether they were 20 or 70 in VR. Um, people who had been in an older body saved three times more money than the people who had been in a young body. So what this points out is that despite there not being any talk about spending behavior, at no point during this experience, the people who had been in VR in the older body had a, they were saving money for retirement. And everyone else was just, you know, I'm going to take vacations. I'm going to spend it on beer. I'm going to get, get someone a present. Um, so essentially what you have here is the idea that VR can subconsciously impact behavior. And that's sort of the outcome of this, of this study. Now, we call it the first power of VR, that it, it creates experiences that impact subconscious behavior. Another experience by the same Stanford, Stanford University, the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford, um, it's called a Superman experiment. There, once again, the same premise. They had two groups. And these two groups, uh, they go into VR and they have the same mission, which is to fly around the city and to find a kid who has diabetes 
and you have to give that kid a shot of insulin. That's the experience. Now, half of the people in this experience went in a helicopter surrounded by uh, physicians and, and medics and doctors, and the other half of the group was Superman. So they were essentially like flying around the city. They were embodying a superhero. Once again, the key part of this experience was the questionnaire. And in the questionnaire, they did something. The, the interviewer had a, 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 little, a little cup with six pens, and he dropped it. And then they waited to see what the interviewee would do. Now, the people who acted in VR as Superman, they would pick up, uh, they could, would take three seconds to pick up a pen, and they would help more. And the people who were in the helicopter, they would take six seconds uh, to pick up a pen, and they wouldn't pick up as many pens. What this shows us in this specific instance is that people who embody virtual superpowers, um, there's an increased sense of subconscious real-life altruism. So once again, behavior change subconsciously through VR. If you're Superman, somehow by embodying a superhero, you're going to become more charitable. You're going to help more. There's an impact on subconscious behavior. And this is something that, as creators, we can leverage. And I wanted to focus on these two experiences for the following reason. Uh, VR is the ultimate user experience. It can impact subconscious behavior, and there's a shift of power between the creator to the audience. So what does it take to create content for VR? As we saw a while ago, the illusion of being physically present in a non-physical space is the idea of presence. And presence, uh, once again, is, is not bullshit. It is the neurologically measure, measurable phenomena. Presence is why 60% of those people could not save the cat. So do you remember the Maslow Pyramid of Needs, that sort of outdated but very useful uh, concept scheme? It describes the human needs that start from the most fundamental basics uh, all the way to the aspirational uh, aspects. So let's apply it to VR creation. So the first thing that we need to achieve is, um, is presence. And the first rule here is do not make your audience puke. So that means to respect the physiological and physical rules like horizons and trajectories because you need to take care of the basics first. Uh, you need to avoid creating a sense of motion sickness in people. Um, and two, three years ago, this was, this was a bigger problem than it is right now. Not so much anymore, but it is still something that as creators we should pay attention to. So do not make your audience turn around too fast, move too fast, because that's going to create a sense of motion sickness. Are you familiar with the idea of the uncanny valley? So the uncanny valley is a theory created by a Japanese robot maker. And he says that the closer that an android robot looks to a human, the more monstrous its imperfections appear. So you can feel empathy for Wally -E or for Pinocchio, uh, but sex dolls and zombies are creepy. They're too close to us. So it's easier, it's like, a, has anyone here ever had a Tamagoshi? One of those pets. It has no fidelity, it doesn't look like anything. It's a very limited number of pixels on a screen, yet I feel love and care for it. Even though it's very uh, not, there's low fidelity. It doesn't represent a living being at all. So that's, that's the idea that I'm trying to transmit here. It's very tempting to try to make things look real, but it's likely to work against you. Presence is not broken um, by talking to an anthropomorphic teacup or by talking to a speaking pair of glasses. But if you try to create a relationship with a zombie, that's going to be a lot difficult because people will notice, will zoom in to the imperfections. Another thing that we've learned is the fidelity contract. So natural behavior response is the idea that in VR, if you're playing a game, you press a button and Mario jumps. There's a mediator between you and the game. But in VR, <clears throat> there is none. If I want to pick up a glass in VR, what do you do? You pick up a glass. There's a natural body response involved in it. Um, so because of that, users expect things to happen in a, in a faithful way to reality. So like objects in VR should react in the same way that they react in real life. If you see that cup over there or if you see that button in VR, if you can press it in real life, then you should be able to press it in VR as well. 
It's easier sometimes to put the person in a white cube that, ha that has nothing in there, because they'll believe it, rather than in a space with a lot of things and a lot of gadgets, but then that person goes uh, to interact and nothing happens. That breaks immersion, that breaks presence, and that's what we want to keep. And that's called fidelity. Um, fidelity builds presence. And, and, and this experience is very interesting. This is called a job simulator. Um, and and it's, it's very interesting the different ways that people <clears throat> interact with this, with this environment. As I said, <clears throat> a friend of mine uh, had a teacup that was dirty. He washed it, and then he drank the tea. I just drank it. And this sort of freedom to interact that is natural in the real world needs to be transmitted as well into VR. Also, make sure to keep your audience safe. It is something that you need to always keep in mind. So don't go too far, or, or if you go far into that natural body interface situation, make sure that they don't uh, fall like this. Now, thinking of the user interface for VR is a different ball game. If you're designing um, reality, then, then, then it's the interactions that I just spoke about in the last slide. Like, in Tekken, a PlayStation game, you press A to punch, and you, or square to punch, and you press X to kick. Um, if you play Tekken or VR boxing, you just punch. Once again, it's the natural body interface, something that I want to focus on. And there's no distance between input and output. It makes them simultaneous and coincidental. Um, so you essentially design rules for a world, but the interactions are down to the user. The interpretation of that world is down to the user because they are the, their experience is the film. Their experience is the director of that film. And the variety of their interactions is unlimited. So as VR storytellers, we are charged with molding experience itself into a story. Um, and none of our storytelling tools so far has actually prepared us fully for that. It's a new medium, and there's a lot that we can learn. How do you tell a story for an audience when the audience is present within the story? And this is the question that will lead us into the second half of this pyramid of needs in VR. So now that we've, we've established comfort, now that people are not puking, and now that people can interpret and interact with the world in a faithful way, let's go up in the pyramid. How to make VR really special? So once again, let's look at a study from the Stanford School, um, from the Stanford University, on what we've called audience experience design. Um, and in this study, they recreate the last days of a Japanese student before he commits suicide. And people are put into VR, but it's actually fake VR. <clears throat> they're actually just given some goggles that have holes punched in it, and they're in a set. In that set, in that physical set, there's an actor, a student in front of them, that is going to perform some tasks. Um, after spending a few minutes in that VR world, the people are told about the character's suicide, and they are asked to explain why. So why did this guy decide to commit suicide? So as you see, this experience happened in three groups. The group on the left had a 90 degree field of view. The middle group had a 180, and the, the final group had a full 360 field of view. So as you can see, the full room was available. And what we discovered was that the people who looked at this experience in the 90 degrees of field of view, they focused on many details. They were looking for clues. They were looking for the video game score of the guy they were looking for the breadcrumbs in the plates. They said, well, he killed himself because of shame because he lost the game. Or they were looking at a very concrete and very um, precise level of detail. Now, the people in the 360, they had a completely different uh, explanation as to why the guy killed himself. They were asking things, well, the room feels really empty. There's no photos of loved ones. Um, it feels really lonely. So essentially, the rule that they have uncovered here was that the more there is to see, the less the audience remembers the details. And the more complete the environment is, the more it resonates. Audience experience design uh, could be said to be, philosophically, a human-centered design lens. It's not about the film. It's about the experience of the person in the film. And essentially, that's why we have to put ourselves in the audience's shoes and understand or try to create and design their cognitive, their emotional, and their physical experience. So 
remembering the Adidas or the escape room examples that we gave in the beginning, how do we design an experience for you to feel one way or for you to feel another way? For you to feel excited about climbing a mountain or for you to try to discover what happened in a vague memory that you don't even remember? Um, in the uh, Saskia Unselt, who used to be the creative director at Oculus Story Studio, which, by the way, closed quite a while ago, says that writers have words and illustrators have images, but in VR, I don't really think it's images. It's more the thoughts that are in the audience's head. It is states of being. It has the potential to invoke and provoke inner states in your audience. Um, so to, to, make, to summarize the idea of audience experience design, this human-centered lens, you take care of the physical, you take care of the perspectives, the movements, and the balance of people. Make sure they're not puking. You take care of the cognitive parts, so you take care of the fidelity contract, make sure stuff reacts appropriately. You make the environment familiar and easy to interact with. And then essentially you try to create communication and generate active emotion. Make sure that the people are emotionally invested in the world. Make sure that the people can create a rapport there. That's, let's look at this very interesting example. We call it Ludo Narrative Dissonance. Um, do you remember this movie? Right, it's, it's, uh, it's Spider-Man, the first one, and this is the, 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 the end of the second act of the movie. Uh, Spidey's uncle has just died, and we're supposed to empathize. We're like, wow, this is sad. This is where he's gonna really step up to the plate and be a superhero. But what if I do this? What happens here uh, in this example is that interactivity kills empathy. Just because those three buttons are there, you have the, you're instantly drawn to, well, I'm gonna try to slap the guy, even though he's in his deathbed. Why? Because it's a game and it's VR, and obviously I'm gonna try every option available. So one of the things to pay attention to is that if we allow interactivity, empathy is over. It becomes a game rather than a film. There's a trade-off. And that trade-off is called the, the, the ludo-narrative dissonance. There's no perfect answer to this. It's a balance that you need to get as a creator, um, but something to pay attention to. Another example is subconscious interactivity. You know, oftentimes when you enter into a game or a VR experience that is interactive, uh, there's a tutorial. They tell you, press this button to do this, press that button to do that. However, this experience is called Notes on Blindness. I don't know if anyone knows it here. And it creates sort of a sound-activated gaze. It's an experience where you step in the shoes of someone um, who is blind. And as you hear the sound in your environment around you, you begin to visualize it. So if you hear the wind blowing on the trees on your right, they will appear visually to you. If you hear a kid running next to you on your left, then you will well, essentially see that, visualize, and appear in real time. So there's a connection there where it spins storytelling on its head. Rather than trying to grab the user's gaze uh, to tell a story, you tell a story depending on where the user looks. This is an important switch around. Instead of telling the people look here or look there, well, people look, and that is uh, how the story unfolds. So let me show you another video. This one doesn't have any sound. So I'm going to explain it as I go. What we're looking at is a clip from, the, from a study from 1944 from Heider Seemel into apparent behavior. And it consisted in showing people these shapes moving around and then asking them, what's happening here? What does this story tell you? The study wanted to understand how people perceive the movement of these abstract shapes. Okay, question for you guys. What did you think happened here? What, what's the story that you saw here? Anyone? Yes? No, I don't have that big story, but at first it seemed to me like a body cap show in which the, the, the biggest tri triangle was uh, one of the partners and the others came to save him, <laughs> uh, but they had a fight. But later on it became a Walking Dead story in which uh, one of them was a zombie and the other were trying to save him first and then escape later. Wow, so, <laughs> very much yeah, so. This is not normal. 
prone to think, but okay. I think that's the best explanation I've ever heard for, for this video, honestly. Um, I usually ask this question because every time someone is asked to impose a story on this video, they come up with a different story. And that's exactly the point. Now, as humans, we naturally perceive patterns and story into abstract shapes. It's triangles and, and circles. So apophenia, it is, it, it, it is a word this, that, that means the spontaneous perception of narrative structure and of patterns in otherwise meaningless elements. Imposing a story on a Hyder Simmel film on this, it is easy to humans, right? You're looking at this and you're like interpreting it through the lens of storytelling. We are storytellers by nature, we are stories. But if you try to get a computer to interpret, that's a whole different ballgame. That's much more difficult. And so this, this serves to reinforce the idea that in virtual reality, it's very useful to spread story in the environment as loose ends for people to connect the dots, right? And as you put the audience there as director, they are the ones that are going to connect these dots and invent a new mode to tell a story, which is not linear, but it is distributed. It is not uh, hierarchical, but rhizomatic, if you will, or a cloud rather than a tree. Um, another thing that you can do is drive the story with your body. <clears throat> this is a really cool experience called Gnomes and Goblins. Um, so you remember the fidelity contract, right? The fidelity contract, the idea that the environment has to be faithful, that has to react appropriately. Um, this story works in the following manner. You have no tutorial, nobody tells you what to do, you go in VR and you are in, a, uh, in, a, in the woods. And then you see a little gnome over there. And whenever you go next to the gnome, it runs away from you. And you're like, what do I have to do here? So slowly but surely, like, you realize that the gnome runs away from you, but there's an acorn on the floor. So you're like, okay, let me pick it up and let me give it to the guy. No, he's gonna run away still. So what you eventually learn by trial and error is that you're supposed to take the acorn, very quietly approach him and put it on the ground, come back again, and then wait for the gnome to come up and take the acorn as a gift. And that's how you move the story. That's how the story moves forward. Now, this is how your body language effectively becomes your input language. Uh, and that's just the beginning. Think about when the technology moves to the point where controllers are going to disappear, where you don't need any controllers in VR. Uh, that's possible today with, with Leap Motion, for example. And soon enough, the interface of virtual reality is going to become very close to the interface of real reality, where we can build relationships with virtual worlds and with characters in ways that are very deeply emotional and even physical. And the creative possibilities in here are endless, but also the responsibility that we have as creators is also huge. Think about eye tracking, the technology that within VR, it knows where you're looking and the story reacts based on that. Think about voice control. You speak to it and it speaks back in a way that makes sense, uh, powered by artificial intelligence, an environment that is completely reactive, that knows you better than you, uh, how do you tell a story in that? What happens to real reality? And artificial intelligence is, it could be the case that it is the user interface of tomorrow. Um, it's already the case with HoloLens, with Alexa, uh, with Cortana, with Siri. You essentially speak to it and it speaks back. And machine learning has shown amazing process in the, in the last years when it comes to de developing this computer vision and developing natural language processing, which is the process by which computers understand how we naturally speak as humans, which is uh, surprisingly a very complex thing. Um, and soon enough, they're gonna be learning about what we say, how we say it, our movements, uh, listening to what we say. And when that happens, AI is going to become a, char a character, but also an author that is procedural, that is working in real time in the space. So that's gonna be another uh, game-changing technology. Now, this is another experience that I added yesterday um, into this presentation. And this example speaks about how the perception of being in someone else's body affects the way we think. We've seen it, how it works uh, with the experience of becoming old, and we saw that that makes you save more money, right? This is another uh, different experience where essentially what happens is <clears throat> You go into a uh, psychiatric uh, room and you have Sigmund Freud in there. 
And what you have to do is you speak to him. And you tell him your problems. Hey, Freud, man, this is going through my head, yada, yada. What happens afterwards, which is the key part of the experience, is you switch bodies. And you, be, you, you go from being in your body into Freud's body. So instead of looking at a guy with a, must, with a, with a white beard and the, white, the, the black glasses, you actually see a guy laying down on a couch describing their problems back to you. What does this mean? It means that you're going to be listening to what you said yourself, but from a third person perspective. And this engenders perspective in a way that enhances feedback, that fast tracks learning. And this model, the model of the body swap, is something that can be applied into many, many areas. We've just used that, for example, very recently for nursing education. How do you train someone for soft skills, for people skills, right? Uh, you don't learn that with a test in school. You don't learn that with uh, an e-learning platform. But you can learn that in VR if you utilize these mechanics to, <clears throat> to enhance, again, soft skill development. Um, what happens afterwards in this experience is that after you listen to your own advice as Freud, you're supposed to give advice back. And then you switch bodies a second time. And so people discovered that they have a more positive response to their own personal advice when it comes from a VR avatar of Freud because people trust uh, somehow Freud more. So that's another, that's another interesting aspect in here because it, it really uh, plays into that aspect of authority, social roles, and how they actually affect human interactions. So we've got the recipe for audience experience design. What are a few common traps? What are things not to do? Um, the first question is how you design a story in space where you don't control what the user sees. Now, one of the things that people do is they, yeah, well, if you look at this image, uh, this is a, a sort of a flattened image of a 360 environment. And in VR, you will only be able to see what's inside the red square. What you see on the right of the image and on the left of the image will happen behind you. So you really cannot look everywhere in VR. So how do you point the user to where you want them to see? We've been through this question before. Many answers that people have given thus far um, is the matador approach. It is you script the gaze that using sound, color, and movement, and you try to create a replacement for the frame in VR. So like a, fl a bird flies and you have to turn your head, a voice to your left and it makes you look, uh, a loud sound makes you look to, to where the, the director wants you to look. Uh, kind of tricking the user, kind of like a, a matador with a cape telling the bull, come here, now come here, now come here. But in our opinion, that's the wrong approach. That's sort of trying to shoehorn in cinema tactics uh, without having the freedom of editing, because you don't have that in VR. So what's, what's the answer to this problem? Um, learning from immersive theater. Uh, do you guys know what immersive theater is? So the idea of immersive theater is that you are embedded in the story world. Instead of going to a theater where you have a stage and you have actors playing out a play, um, what happens in immersive theater is that you dress up and you go and you speak to the actors and you speak to everyone else and you have a mask and all of a sudden you're in the story participating, affecting the story. If I don't like what's happening in this room, I can go to the other room and start opening drawers, and I start picking up stuff that is inside the drawers. So you're free to explore the world. You're free to connect the dots in your own way. And I believe that this is a very interesting, uh, this has very interesting lessons to VR, because there you have the agency, and you are free to connect the dots in your own pace, in your own time. Uh, and by being embedded in this story world, uh, a new reality tunnel is created. And what that means is that by being in this new reality tunnel, people will act by a new set of rules. If you have a mask and, you, and if you're in a, in a hotel where everyone is dressed like it's the 1920s, guess what? You're going to start to act like it's the 1920s. You're going to start to think like it's the 1920s. And you're going to start to relate to people in that way. And let me tell you, it's, it's, it's uh, very fun. Now. Narrative potential refers to the opportunities within an immersive environment that invite user engagement. Um, media like film and literature offer stories with predetermined outcomes. They're more or less linear. Um, it's the job of the writers and the filmmakers to fully deliver the world in the story. But with immersive tech, a new paradigm is coming. And that's 
the paradigm that says that it is the job of the creators to build the worlds to invite audience participation, and that allows the, the audience to create and direct the story for themselves. So, as we've looked, uh, many immersive creators are asking and, and have wondered how to direct the audience's attention. How do you tell a story? How do you create a content within immersive experiences? But instead of directing, in, in my opinion, a better way to frame it is to invite engagement. Have you ever, um, have you ever danced in techno in a library? Probably not. Have you ever read a book in a nightclub? Obviously, why? Because people are silent in libraries. That's what people do. And in a nightclub, you stand close together and you dance, um, and you can look ridiculous, and it's fine because everyone else is also looking ridiculous. So you don't need to say it or to write it or to have a tutorial at the entrance. You just know it. It's how it is. Spaces come with implicit social rules. And at the heart in VR, you're designing spaces. That's why, once again, we come back to the idea that the space is a story. Uh, ontological design is the idea that you're designing a person's experience of existence itself. If you well remember in philosophy class, ontology is that part of philosophy that dedicates itself with existential questions, with the existence, uh, with existence itself. So ontological design is being creative towards that very sense of existence. Um, you are actually designing people's behaviors through space. So the space is the canvas for a story that you inhabit. You don't tell people to look at the stage. You build a stage, and then you invite the people. So let's, let's look at another example. Alex McDowell was the production designer for Minority Report. Do you remember the movie? Minority Report with Tom Cruise. Um, so, so usually the designer gets the scripts of the movie, and then he builds a world on top of it. In this case, it was the other way around. First, they build the world. They build the futuristic world with laws and with technology, with flying cars, with the special police. First, that came. And only afterwards did the, did the narrative came, did the script came. Um, this was actually adapted from a Philip K. Dick novel where the world was already so built and it was so rich. So they started building the world first. And then after that, um, they put the user in the world and they decided to create the story. <clears throat> Think of Star Wars or Mad Max. How many spin-offs of Star Wars can you make? Infinite, because there's a world already and then you just have to put the people in there. Um, the design of a well-researched and richly detailed world becomes a platform for multiple stories to emerge coherently and organically. We're designing systems. That's my point. VR shifts our experience to a holistic relationship with the world, its inhabitants, and the human lens. Holistic is, is, is very much a key word in here. We're designing holistic systems for interaction and narrative rather than linear ideas. <clears throat> so in a sense, we actually have to take some lessons from successful world builders. Mad Max, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, these are all worlds that function as platforms for multiple narratives. These are spaces and worlds where people actually have a chance to go in and live their own stories, to be their own directors uh, within a framework that we design. And that central picture over there is a good example. In London, there's um, the platform 9 and 3 quarters. is very famous because it appears in Harry Potter. I'm, I'm sure most of you know it. People just make a line and pay a ticket to take a picture in there. What is that? That's a place where narrative and reality, they mingle. That's a little portal into a narrative dimension, right? If you go there and you pretend enough, you're actually in the Harry Potter world. And that's a key thing, because the way that you design for VR is the way that you design outside of VR. And you actually have to understand reality as a holistic whole uh, to actually go for that. So to finish this, humans are storytellers. We don't live in space. We live in story. Space is story. Look at this, the story that we are in right now. Uh, it, it, it's a space that, where we are able to live into this, in this portal where we go into other places in time and we see the visions of other people. Religions, nations, even our relationship with others and ourselves can be said to be fictions, to be stories. It's all about 
uh, whenever you tell someone what you did yesterday, you, you tell a story about it. I started with this, then I did this, then I did this, and then I finished there. So it started around the fire in tribal settings, and then we specialized. Um, we started to look into architecture, into music, into theater, visual arts. Now we have games and writing. And all of these different people, they are storytellers in a way. And what I think the virtual reality is propelling us towards is a convergence of all of these disciplines into something that could be called a lot of stuff. It could be called storyscaping. It could be called ontological design, designing existence. But the crux of the matter is that these are the new breed of storytellers that are necessary for VR. People who understand that you're creating holistic environments, holistic stories. Um, you're designing the raw material of existence itself, the points which people are then invited to connect. And um, then people can go inside and connect and experience their own version of this um, and create their own personalities. So. Hopefully, you can bring storyscaping ideas to, to your own practice. Um, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Let's uh, ask, ask away the questions that you have to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Great, and uh, uh, I totally agree with the space. But what I'm missing, and uh, as a VR creator, uh, also is the big issue and the big problem is the body. Where is the body? Who am I? Uh, the most uh, asked question uh, is wh when you put a person in VR, maybe for the first time. Uh, if you shot in a 360 video, the question is why I'm so tall or why I'm so different? Where is my body? This yeah. relationship with space and body is very, it's very one, much so. one challenge. It's central. central. Um, once the technology becomes <clears throat> effective enough to simulate bodies with a high degree of fidelity, then we will become more, uh, then we'll be capable of implementing insights such as the one that I explained in the Stanford experience, of what's the difference between being 20 or being 70, or what's the difference between using your body to call the gnome and not scare it too much, because that's how you relate to, to with your body in the world, um, the way that you dress in a nightclub or in a church. So absolutely, the question of the body and, and how it is placed in virtual worlds is essential. <clears throat> How to answer that question will depend on <clears throat> the creator and will depend on the experience. And it's a question that is going to become more and more relevant as technology allows us to reproduce bodies more faithfully in virtual environments. <clears throat> uh, any more questions? Um, I have a to this, um, the psychology VR from uh, the experiment of the Stanford University. I mean, can you explain that again to me? Because, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I kind of got confused. I have okay. a feeling there's a lot of artificial intelligence in there because they have to gather information about yeah, me. Yeah. So, uh, absolutely, I'll, I'll explain it again. There's no artificial intelligence involved, and it was a sort of a study that serves to, to, show, uh, to show the hypothesis that VR can impact subconscious behavior. And what's more, uh, impact spending behavior, which is something that pure people are obviously very in interested in. So you had two groups of students. One of them uh, was put into the VR space as a 20-year-old, and the other one as a 70-year-old. They had the same experience, but a different avatar, a different body. So the group that had a body that was 20-year-old, they would do the same activities, all of them, it didn't matter what activities you do. And you do a lot of them to feel embodied. You play the bongo, you play in the mirror. The idea really here is to ensure that you are habituated and you have presence within that body. And the key thing is that when you take your, the, the person outside of that, just the fact that they've inhabited a different body for a period of 20 to 30 minutes impacts their behavior when it comes to spending. So here's $1,000. Where are you going to spend it? 
Um, and you ask this question to the people who are 20-year-old avatars, and they're going to spend it on partying. and it's, They don't have this future vision because I'm 20. But if you've just been 70 in that body, you start to think, OK, wait, I have $1,000. Maybe I should, should save some for the future because it really creates the subconscious image of a future. It formulates an idea that is embodied via presence in their mind, which changes their behavior. So that's the key thing that they sort of alluded to here, changing behavior. Uh, sorry, but you misunderstood me. I meant the one about Dr. Freud. Ah, the Freud one, yeah. yeah that's why I meant the psychology. OK, OK. Sorry. Got it. So, so the Freud one is a cool one. It's, uh, it doesn't involve any AI as well. It's really just switch avatars. It's a basic, basic technology, cheap to make. So what it, what, it, what it does is, step one, you go into the world, you have an avatar, you speak to Freud. And for two minutes, you speak, and the VR records. Yeah. Yeah? Second step is you go into the body of Freud, and you see a guy lying down on his couch speaking a recording to you, which is actually your voice. And then by doing that, it engenders a sense of perspective. Uh, and the body swap mechanics is very interesting mechanics because it does exactly that. And, uh, what, in step two, what you have to do is you listen and you give advice, as if you were Freud. So in order to solve this problem that you're having at home, why didn't you try to do this, this, and that? And then step three, you go back into the original body and you hear that advice. And what happened was that if that advice, even though it comes from you, if you see it coming from Freud, you'll listen to it more. You will internalize it more. It will have more effectivity. Um, so the reason why I showed that Freud example is uh, is, is to show this body swap mechanic, this switching presence and perspective and bodies in VR is a really cool tool to teach people to do stuff, uh, to teach soft skills, like I said. Um, it creates a feedback loop between your mind and yourself, and so that's why it's, it's important. Um, I, I didn't understand the when you were speaking about sub subconscious uh, interactivity, you explained uh, there was a, um, a video where you were hearing sounds and then the oh, spaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, can you uh, yes, explain it more? Because it. I'll actually pull up that slide. Yeah. So the slide on notes on blindness, right? This one. Yeah. So the, the way that this experience works is that it's meant to show how life looks like but it looks like from the, from the perspective of a blind person. Now, a blind person cannot see, but they can hear very well. And the way that they relate to their environment is not like people who can see, uh, based on color, shape, et cetera, but it's based on other mechanics. And in VR, what this experience tries to do is investigate those mechanics. So when you go into the VR, you see everything black. You don't see anything. But then you hear the wind going through some, some leaves on a tree, and all of a sudden, the tree appears, and then it disappears, when the wind disappears. And when, you hear a sound, when there's a kid running by you, and you hear that sound, if you look to the side, a kid appears running around. And when the noise of the kid stops, you stop seeing him. And so the way that the narrative moves forward is through sound. Sound triggers vision. So that's the way that um, you direct the story and that it moves forward. And the relationship with the unconscious part of it is that it really shows to tell you that we are oftentimes uh, not focusing on the subconscious aspects of how we interact with the world and their relevance. And what this experience did is really focus on part of it, like how would a blind person interact with a space? So I, did I answer your question? Yes. Um, because I. Uh so there are two levels, not only um, creating spaces, but also being uh, interactive with the movement of the, yeah, of yeah. the people. So it's, um, yeah, it's, I, I was trying to... Yeah, yeah. To, I'm it, yeah. I, I think you could think of this experience as a sound-driven experience. The sound appears, and when you hear it, you see it. Uh, and that's different than other experiences in VR where you actually have to see and you look around. And by switching that on its head, you invent a new way to interact with a story, which is a little bit more subconscious. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Really a question, more of a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, when you mentioned the three aspects, uh, you know, um, the physical uh, yeah. aspect, uh, the uh, cognitive aspect, the emotional aspect, and the connected dots part, uh, it made me think a lot uh, about a uh, kind of audience that I've been studying the past few years. Uh, that's uh, the audience made up of fans, uh, fans of TV show, fans of movies, and so on. Because, um, in a way, that's different from other kind of audiences. Uh, they are very involved in the story, and often they are responsible for the success uh, and uh, of a movie like Star Wars uh, or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and. Uh, um, there, are, there have been a lot of studies about their, uh, what moves them, uh, and it's often the emotional content and the possibility to um, put their minds inside the story and connect the dots. Uh, so they feel like the perfect audience uh, for VR somehow. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it would be an interesting thing to study how they react uh, to, uh, to VR in specific contexts like mm, Comic Cons uh, or mm -hmm. Similar situations. Yeah, it's very pertinent that you say that. That that happens today. Uh, big IPs, intellectual properties uh, like Star Wars, like Harry Potter, they m understand this <clears throat> and they make sure that they have the ability to use VR to put their audience in their world because their strength and their value and their capital is really on the world, on the story. The the Star Wars world, for example, to take that as an example, is. You have the rebels, and you have the other guys, and you have the spaceships. I, I don't know. I'm not a fan too much. Uh, but <clears throat> what happens there, essentially, is that you can create endless spin-offs. Every year, there's a new movie, and you could do this for 300 years and not exhaust the world. So when brands uh, understand this, when Disney, who owns Star Wars now, tries to understand this and look for new ways to engage with their audience, um, they very intelligently give a small portion of their audience, which are the more hardcore fans, they intentionally give them something more special. People who will actually drive to the Comic-Con to see this experience. People who will actually pay 40 euros to participate and to become a stormtrooper, right? Uh, people who have the ability to participate in these big budget uh, recreations of Star Wars. Those are the people who will actually travel and do the effort and get that reward of being face-to-face -face and fighting with Darth Vader, for example. So their fans are very creative, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, mm -hmm. <laughs> because they, um, they don't only join this kind of events, but they take them and they write their own stories, they, write, they draw their own fan arts uh, and so on. So they become something like authors uh, or co-authors yes. of the story, yes. uh, prosumers, uh, I've heard the word. And uh, yeah, that's, yeah. That uh, reminds that's me cool. a lot of what you do in VR, in which you are not only someone who looks at things, but someone that is part of things. Absolutely. So it's not designing a story or a movie or a linear system. No, you're, design you're designing a system of relations between consumer and story in, in various touch points, in VR, at their home, writing fan uh, fiction, or, or wearing a t-shirt, so you're actually engendering this holistic system of relations where each fan comes in and does their own point to the story. They add their own point to the story. Absolutely. In, in this case, it's, uh, right now it's online a uh, VR version of Star Wars made by fans, and they, they are uh, like distributing in the uh, underground world uh, till this day. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, and and it's fully working, and you you are in Star Wars. It's incredible. And made by my fans. Fans. Yeah. We're co-creating these worlds. They're participating in the cool part, which is uh, designing worlds, designing experiences uh, to interact there. They're not taking the lead from Disney. We don't need Disney. We have the world already. In a way. In a way. In a, in a real. In a real life. Absolutely. Great. Mm -hmm. There's also a project in Austria where they actually have they made their own star, but they made up, they, had, they actually were allowed to do that. I mean, there was also a couple of real fans, and they kind of you know crowdfunded this whole movie, and you know they made this kind of you know Star Wars, Star Wars spin-off in some uh, in some district of Vienna. So it was very funny. It was mm -hmm. all the kind of usual kind of science and, and every kind of Star Wars environment, but you know, it was clear it was made by fans. Yeah, yeah, very much so. That's sort of the active participation in reality tunnels. They were invited and they accepted the invitation, not only within the VR, but even going meta outside of the VR, creating the environment themselves. 
So it's really, no, I want to live in this world. VR is a tool. Yeah. There's others. Um, very cool. But uh, I have a question, which is basically, why do you think um, there is so much hesitation uh, in VR, in the VR world? Uh, to create their own and original stories. Mm -hmm. Is this only because of the money, or why do you think that it is? I think it's a combination of factors. One of them is um, <clears throat> money. Secondly is that the technology and the creation methods are not necessarily geared for consumers yet. It's for a very small subset of consumers. Um, that's why I believe that right now the biggest value proposition for VR is in business where you have to create these value propositions to, to help uh, BMW train 5,000 people. Instead of actually traveling them all the way to Germany, you give them a headset and they learn there. Yeah. So there's money to be saved there, so there's, there's VR to be happening there. <clears throat> when it comes to the creation part of things and making it a grassroots system like you were asking, I think we're still a little bit far away from that. <clears throat> but I think that that's going to change when Apple, for example, comes into the game with uh, augmented reality headsets. They have the patents. They're waiting for the right moment. Other people are actually already preparing the groundwork for that. Um, you mentioned to me a while ago that Google platform that allows for streaming. So once the technology hits that breaking point where it becomes affordable and desirable for consumers, then it's going to be as ubiquitous as a smartphone. It's going to be, everyone has a smartphone today, but 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you ask people, do you need a smartphone? No, I have a phone at home. Why would I need a, a phone, a portable phone? So we still have to go through that process, but it's coming. So uh, if you have to design uh, a VR experience, and you have to uh, follow all these rules that uh, I actually agree with that. <coughs> And you have to respect the fidelity contract, so uh, the experience is interactive somehow. So if there's a pen, I can pick up the pen. And this makes it interactive. But on the other hand, interaction kills empathy. Uh, so how can you uh, tell stories, interactive stories, that still works on a uh, mm -hmm. empathic level? Yeah, so, yeah. The fun part about being a creator or a designer is that you don't have to follow rules. You follow them if they suit you. If they don't suit you, screw them. Well, that's the fun part. You pick what suits you. Uh, and you balance. You balance everything with regards to the last goal, to the ultimate goal that you have, which is going to be presence or engagement or uh, artistic quality. So when you're, when you're following these rules, um, they're sort of not necessarily rules, but uh, rules of thumb, guiding posts. If, you're one, if you want to use interactivity, then make sure that there's a natural body interface at play there. But if you want to create an emotional story, then maybe don't add too much interactivity, you know what I mean? So obviously balancing that out is, is something that, you know, as a creator, you have that prerogative. You can decide. So that, that's how I would answer that. Yeah. Um, is it possible for someone uh, so, sorry, could you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Thank you. Is it possible for someone who uh, does not have any uh, special training in VR or informatics system to uh, begin designing VR on his own by self-taught, basically? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So to give you my example, I used to be an architect. Then I got into 3D modeling a little bit, but not too deeply. Um, and I got into VR a little bit on my own sort of autodidactic way, but not too deeply. So I have that basic knowledge, a little bit how it works on the technical side, but uh, most of what I do is creative and strategy and concept. So I would say that for your case, it's definitely, uh, it's de it depends on your training. And like to build a house, you have a lot of different specialities. You have the architect, the engineer, you have uh, the person who does the plumbing, the electrician, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to do all of them yourself. You don't have to, but you can choose one, the one that suits you the most, and go with it. I'm, I chose design and, and strategy and concept. Um, there are other people and, and within this sort of VR pipeline. Psychology. Mm. So uh, basically, I have mm, theoretically I have no actual knowledge in computers. I uh, started one month ago, but I have very limited systems. I don't have a very good PC or phone. Mm. 
So is it still possible to, to do something? I use Unity, so basically, yeah. basic graphic motor. I would say that the main thing for, for someone like you with your specific skill set is to connect with people who have complementary skills. So you don't need to code, but I don't, know, I don't know, hang around with someone who codes or who does Unity. And uh, try to create a team where you fulfill every necessary role for the creation of the experience. And that's, that's something that you can investigate very easily and that you should know. Um, but there is a spot and a role for each individual person. Um, and definitely, there's going to be a road between the moment that you are right now in psychology uh, and the moment when that knowledge is specifically relevant for the creation of VR, for example, if that's what you want to do. Yeah, OK, so basically, I can still learn something from myself, even though Absolutely. I sh shouldn't be supposed to. Yeah, you don't have to code. You don't have to do Unity. But make sure that the knowledge that you have um, is useful for the creation of VR, you know? Make sure that you bring something of your own that is relevant to the table. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, well, in, th in that case, then I guess thank you very much for your time and uh, have a good day.